here in Britain, we should be used to wild weather. Watch it! But this winter, things have been worse than ever. Oh, my God! Floods on a biblical scale. Blown from hell to high water by hurricane-force winds. And battered by the very roughest of rough seas. Some saw the chaos as more of a blessing than a curse. But for most, it's been nothing but misery. The storms have killed 10 people in the UK, ruined the lives of thousands, and caused a billion pounds worth of damage. We will see how the wild weather at the end of last year has set the scene for what has become a record-breaking winter. We'll meet people whose lives have been shattered. There's nothing you could do to stop it. You, you're just part of a nightmare. We'll hear from experts about why it happened. The weather is an enormously complex beast. It really is the case that if a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon, Reading can be flooded. And over two programmes, we'll see if anything could have been done to ease the pain of the wettest winter ever. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Back in December, we thought we were facing weather Armageddon. Trains were cancelled, roads were blocked, and thousands of would-be travellers were grounded at one of the world's busiest airports. Take a seat until we have more information about your flight. We're actually in a real live horror movie here. For those who stayed at home, the situation was little better. Power cuts plunged upwards of 50,000 people into darkness on Christmas Day. And they were the lucky ones. Some families lost almost everything they had. It's heartbreaking to think that once we lived here, now everything's gone. Things were bad, but we all hoped the worst was over. We could clean up and move on. How wrong could we be? Things kept getting worse, and worse, and worse. For four months now, we have been suffering at the hands of a conveyor belt of awful weather as parts of the country turned into water world. Meteorologist Caddy Lee Preston has been studying our climate for more than a decade. She used to forecast the weather for Britain's fighter pilots. In January, she took to the skies above Somerset to see the damage for herself. This is the Somerset levels, and as you can see, it's just massively flooded. You just see tops of trees, hedges, sticking out of the water, and it's been like this for weeks. It's just lakes with little shrubs in, and yet this is people's fields, this is people's livelihoods. There's a village there that's completely cut off, it's nearly surrounded by the water that's almost turning into a little island. I bet living there is pretty horrible at the moment, quite scary. And it's not just here. The whole country has faced a ceaseless barrage of storms. Weather experts agree that the main culprit is a powerful high-altitude river of air, the jet stream. We always have the jet stream affecting our weather. It's just a, a narrow band of very strong winds at quite high level, 30,000 feet and it's caused purely by the temperature difference between the cooler Arctic air and the warmer subtropical air, and where the two meet, that's where we get our jet stream. At times this winter, the jet stream was speeding at 200 miles per hour, 
double its normal velocity. This year, shifting equatorial winds and the North American cold snap combined to create an unusually large difference between the balmy south and the frozen north. In turn, that made the jet stream stronger and faster than normal. We've got the strong jet, strong contrast in temperature. We tend to get more rainfall and more storms, and that's exactly what's happened this year. The problems started way back at the end of October last year. It was then that the jet stream pushed the first big weather beast towards our shores. On October the 27th, the nation's weathermen and women warned that a major storm was on the way. Gusts of wind in excess of 80 miles an hour are expected to start battering the southwest from midnight. Starting way back in October, but we had a very, very deep depression which brought lots of rain and lots of strong winds. That was one of the wettest storms we've had for, for quite some time. The following day was the feast day of St. Jude the Apostle, patron saint of desperate cases and lost causes. So the incoming tempest was dubbed the St. Jude's Day Storm. The so-called St. Jude Storm ranks fairly high up in the, in the annals of meteorology. Certainly we had lots of places with gusts of over 70 miles an hour, one or two with gusts of over 80 miles an hour, and one with one on the needles, almost 100 miles an hour. When the winds blow that hard, driving becomes extremely treacherous. Across the country, high-sided vehicles suddenly toppled over, like this truck on the M11 near Stansted. Twenty minutes later, and just 50 miles to the north, in Hadley, Suffolk, a bus was blown clean onto its side. She started gusting stronger and stronger, and the bus was swaying, and next thing I know, I had no steering. The bus's CCTV captured the moment David was thrown from his seat and landed on the passenger doors. The spring-loaded seat on the bus had actually thrown me up in the air and I'd smacked my head on the roof. I was out cold and I was going through the air backwards. Some motorists travelling behind the now upturned bus rushed to help. A camera on the upper deck catches the surreal sight of them running along the windows and climbing through the sideways-facing stairwell to reach David and the passengers downstairs. Astoundingly, Everybody on board escaped with only minor injuries. It could have easily been so much worse. The extreme winds and heavy rains from the storm created another serious problem, falling trees. Because the storm came so early in the season, many trees still had all their leaves. These acted like sails, catching the wind and forcing the trees over. Others fell because the sodden ground became too weak to hold them upright. Across the country, tens of thousands of trees were uprooted, some causing catastrophic damage. In the middle of the night, one of the trees to topple was in the West London suburb of Hounslow. It punctured a gas main under the street, and at 7.35 the next morning, an unlucky spark ignited gas that had built up over several hours. The explosion reverberated throughout the neighborhood. Suddenly our house shook, um, the bed moved, and we could hear things come crashing down. Um, car alarms started going off in the street, um, I screamed. So I ran out in my pyjamas um, to see what was going on. A policeman shouted at me and asked me to go back inside and I asked what had happened and he'd said a tree had fallen and there'd been a gas explosion. Two people were killed in Hounslow, along with three others elsewhere in the UK. The gales then spread across northern Europe where a further eight people died. Denmark was hit by record gusts of more than 120 miles an hour. 
And in Amsterdam, this cyclist had the narrowest of escapes. The St. Jude's Day storm was but a foretaste of the weather nightmare to come. In just two days, the UK received five billion tons of rainfall. It was as though the contents of Loch Ness had been upturned on our heads. That water topped out rivers, lakes and streams and began saturating the rocks beneath our feet. Britain's natural aquifer storage systems holding trillions of gallons of water in underground rock formations. The stage was set for a watery disaster that would unfold over the following months. When we had the St. Jude's Day storm in October, a lot of us thought that was it, that was our stormy season out of the way. Little did we know we had so much more still to come. OK, son, you decide. The St. Jude's Day chaos had been bad. But heading into December, a new storm was coming, threatening to batter Britain's coastline at the same time as the very highest of high tides hit our shores. The combination of wind and tide promised to deliver the biggest storm surge in 60 years. Meteorologist Caddy Lee Preston foresaw dangerous times ahead. To get a storm surge, you really just need an intense area of low pressure, so you've got rising air, strong winds, and of course, high tides. And the low pressure means that the air is rising above the water and it kind of sucks it up a little bit. It causes the sea levels to rise slightly. When you've got the strong winds whacking in behind that, it just pushes all that water onto the coast. And you've got high tides anyway. You've got severe flooding. Some places had 18 feet higher sea levels than they normally get. Predictions of weather even worse than St. Jude had produced came horribly true. On the 5th of December, before dawn broke, winds gusted up to an astonishing 142 miles an hour in Scotland. But it wasn't until midday that the dangerous mixture of wind and tide began its widespread destruction. Together they formed the much feared storm surge that followed the path of high tides along the coast. The worst tidal surge in 60 years is sweeping down England's east coast as thousands of households are braced for a battering tonight. Sea defences were breached and the vulnerable east coast prepared their King Canute defences. At Horsey, on the coast of Norfolk, fears ran high for hundreds of young lives. Because it wasn't just people under threat. Wildlife, too, was in danger. I think that's one out to sea there, look. Beaches in Norfolk were peppered with colonies of newborn Atlantic grey seals, whose mothers had struggled ashore to give birth. The storm surge was racing towards pups utterly dependent on their mothers and massively ill-prepared to brave the ocean waters. Volunteers who monitor the seal population knew that the storm surge was coming. This tide was going to be a real big one, so we were very concerned. But there was nothing anyone could do to save the baby seals. Seals bond with their mother at birth, so if we went in and touched the pups and moved them, we would leave our scent on them, and then the, the mother would probably abandon it. So we felt really helpless, but all we could do was watch and wait. As darkness fell, the surge smashed into the low-lying coast of East Anglia. High tide hit Norfolk around 8 p.m. And from there, the surge powered south. At Lowestoft in Suffolk, high tide came at about 11 p.m. It was even higher than predicted. 
predicted. And once the water breached the defenses, it flowed from house to house. Seriously, seriously flooding it. You see all the way through. We went downstairs and all we heard was just this gushing of water just piling through, water everywhere. We literally had a matter of five minutes before it was up to your waist. You're watching all your stuff being taken away by water. You know, you just know there and then your, all your stuff is ruined. By the end of the night, 1,400 homes in the east of England were flooded. The next morning on the Norfolk beaches, the seal wardens were desperate to see what had happened to all their pups. There's this scene of devastation, really, on the beach. The day before, our beach was full of newborn pups. Nothing there. They're just gone. It was really heartbreaking. In fact, several of our wardens were actually crying. It was heartrending. We did a seal count and found that there was about 265 pups missing. Back in Lowestoft, when the water went down, Michaela was homeless. And it couldn't have happened at a worse time. It was so close to Christmas. It's just like you get ruined like three weeks before Christmas. The neighborhood has been devastated. Around the corner, Amy Judge has also been flooded out of her home. Because this house is near on 100 years old, the bricks can actually hold about a litre of water per brick. So, as you can imagine, it can actually take quite a long time just for the drying process. To help the bricks dry, builders have already stripped off the plaster. But it wasn't just water that soaked the house, because when drains flood, the sewage system can run backwards. Everything was just black and there was just like sewage and black muck all in the cupboards. Every it was everywhere. It was absolutely everywhere. And I mean, that's human sewage, so it's not exactly very hygienic. Even though Lower Stoft was flooded with sewage, at least the houses were left standing. Back up the coast at Hemsby in Norfolk, some people weren't so lucky. Steve and Jackie Connolly used to live right here in a bungalow overlooking the sea. But the storm surge undermined the cliff, and in the night, their house started slipping away. We were scared, really scared. We were going around like headless chickens because we couldn't get it to our heads that it was actually going. I'd have still been standing in the kitchen, trying to get stuff out of the kitchen, and I'd have gone down with it. Dawn the next day, revealed the full extent of the disaster. Seven houses in Hemsby were severely damaged. Three of them, including Steve and Jackie's, were utterly destroyed. It's heartbreaking to think that once we lived here, now everything's gone. It's heartbreaking. We didn't have a Christmas, because we, we lost everything we had for Christmas. We just wiped Christmas out altogether. But amongst the terrible loss and destruction the storm surge brought to Norfolk, there was some heartwarming news. One of our wardens was walking at Winterton and actually found 190 pups had been washed up there. With their white coats, they get waterlogged and they get cold, and generally speaking, they drown. So for them to have survived being washed a couple of miles down the coast was quite tremendous. They may have survived, but most lost their mothers. So RSPCA centre manager Alison Charles is now foster mother to 108 Atlantic Grey seal pups. And they started coming in, it was just chaos. There was seals coming in, um, and we didn't know how many. It was an amazing day, never known anything like it. With so many baby seals, the staff were struggling to think of names for each one. We don't give them names for cuteness. It's not because we're being sippy-soppy with them. It's just that we need to keep their drugs and their feet correct. 
Then someone suggested calling them all after breakfast foods. This one is black pudding, and that was pretty dangerous. The winter had barely started, and we'd already had two record-breaking storms. It's all down to an unusually fast jet stream, the high-altitude river of air that creates storms over the Atlantic, then pushes them towards Britain. At the Met Office, scientists have discovered one reason why the jet stream can become supercharged. It's called the Ebden effect, named after the Met Office researcher who discovered it. The Ebden effect's a relatively newly discovered phenomenon. And essentially, it's about the interaction between a strong river of winds, 25 kilometers up near the equator, and the jet stream that brings all our winter weather north. For part of the time, the strong equatorial wind blows around the globe from east to west. But then, about every 14 months, atmospheric waves rising from the tropics reverse its direction. And when it runs from the west to the east, it can give our jet stream a massive boost. The impact it has on the jet stream that we see at this time of year is that it's stronger, it's longer, and it brings to us a lot more of these low pressures and hence the nasty stormy weather we've been having for the past month. It's now thought that the Ebden effect was also a contributory factor in our worst single storm in living memory, the so-called UK hurricane of 1987. And thanks to the Ebden effect, the worst of 2013's weather was far from over. See, it's very windy. The jet stream was bringing us a Yuletide surprise. The tree was floating around me, the Christmas presents, they were all floating. So bad, they called it the weather bomb. By Christmas Eve, winds and waves were building up around Britain again, and forecasters warned of yet more storms to come. Crowds in their last-minute shopping frenzy had no idea how bad it was going to get. Britain was about to be hit by record low atmospheric pressure. Barometer readings so abnormal that the Met Office calls them explosive deepenings. The Americans like to call these events weather bombs. Early on Christmas Eve, barometer readings fell through the floor. In the Hebridean island town of Stornoway, weather stations recorded an air pressure reading of 936.8 millibars the lowest UK figure for more than 120 years. 936.8 millibars is incredibly low, and it just means the air will have been going upwards at an incredible rate. Meteorologist Caddy Lee Preston understood the chaos the weather bomb was likely to bring. There'll have been hailstorms, rainstorms, flooding, everything, and of course the strong winds to go with it. It's, it's very exceptional to have such a low pressure. The storm did not disappoint. It was exactly what Britain did not need. We were now vulnerable to an extreme flood event. Christmas Eve is normally one of the busiest travel days of the year. But not this year. The great Christmas getaway became the great Christmas travel nightmare. Forecasters say yet more heavy rain is on the way. At 4.45 a.m. on Christmas Eve, the normally benign River Mole in West Sussex burst its banks. It shouldn't really have been more than a localised disaster. But then floodwaters headed in the worst possible direction, towards Gatwick Airport. Please, can you make your way to the left-hand side? We're going to take you, we're going to decontrol you. That means your flight has been cancelled. You're sending me back to Edinburgh? What are you doing now? No one's here. No one's here. Two flooded switch rooms knocked out power to the North Terminal on one of the airport's busiest days. The word chaos doesn't even come close. 
Around 100 flights were cancelled or diverted, and 3,000 passengers stranded for up to 12 hours. We're actually in a real live horror movie here. Excuse me, please, please, could you just give me some silence? Sunny holidays were ruined. Dad's gone purple because his blood pressure is undoubtedly up. I'm the colour of a bishop's cassock. And temperatures were rising. Gatwick Airport said they didn't want to take part in this program. In retrospect, those crowded into departure lounges might just have been the lucky ones. Strong winds meant passengers landing at various airports all over Britain were sometimes little more comfortable in the air. Aircraft can land safely in surprisingly strong winds. Believe it or not, this is what's supposed to happen when landing in these kinds of conditions. Go around, that's 15, that's 15. Let's take eight around. Can I call him going around, please? Commercial pilot Captain Rick Cordes knows that pilots are trained to handle such situations. Although the Christmas storms look quite alarming, you know, for the general public, unfortunately there were no incidents over that period, so I think it's a testament to good decision-making uh, from the pilots involved. Force heading... Within limits, and we'll be landing this on is a simulator for a Boeing 737-800. It's a safe way of demonstrating challenging in-flight situations, such as gusty crosswind landings. The wind is changing all the time. It destabilizes the actual approach profile. So you're constantly having to make adjustments, lowering the nose, raising the nose, applying power, decreasing the power and making sure that you stay on the extended center line of the runway. We're actually coming in what we call uh, in a crabbed type approach, so it's, it's angled into wind. So that means just before we touch down, we have to straighten the aircraft with rudder uh, and then make sure it stays on the center line of the runway. Quite a complex set of uh, processes. Immediately before Christmas, up to 80 flights a day were diverted to unexpected destinations in the UK. Captain Peter Strange is one of Britain's most experienced airline pilots. You think you're OK to land, and right at the last minute, a large, strong gust of wind, and sometimes they can be very, very strong, means that you just have to get out of there. You just have to go around, bringing the aircraft into the climbing attitude and climb away to much better weather conditions. Back on land that was anything but dry, there were more than 100 flood warnings on Christmas Eve. Many driving home for Christmas would have been better off sailing a boat. Well-known flood black spots, such as this bridge in Essex, caught out driver after driver. The rescue teams always use flat-bottomed dinghies, knowing that just inches of fast water can sweep people off their feet. The true extent of the motoring chaos over Christmas was revealed in an astonishing statistic from the AA. John Seymour is the AA's flooded vehicle specialist. In 2012, remembered as the year Britain flooded, his organization rescued motorists stranded in water at the rate of 340 every two weeks. During this Christmas deluge, it rescued six times as many. In the two weeks uh, Christmas and into New Year, 
we dealt with over 2,000 just in that two week period. So that gives an understanding of the impact that the weather had on the motoring public. It's important to remember that it takes only a small amount of water into the engine to wreck the engine. An egg cup full is all it takes. The engine works by compressing a mixture of gas and air and the explosion takes place and that's what drives the engine. But if there's water in there, when the piston rises to compress the fuel mixture, it can't compress the water. And the result can be a broken con rod, a broken piston rod, or even the engine block itself shattered. The irony is that sometimes British motorists happily ploughed on up the creek without a paddle in sight. Even the biggest cars are no protection. Over the Christmas New Year period, a number of things became apparent. First of all, too many 4x4 drivers thought that because their car had off-road capability, it was amphibious. That's not the case. Flooded roads were bad enough, but for sheer human misery, nothing compares with the cost of flooded homes. Jeff Leahy and his partner, Kat Reese live near the River Medway in Kent. The bedroom window of their home is just above the brick course in this building, around 15 feet above river level. I remember waking up thinking, oh, I wonder if the river's gone down. And I opened the bedroom window and I looked out and I couldn't see the cars. It was like a bad dream. The car park had become a lake and we were in it and I was thinking, good Lord, how do we get out of this? How in God's name do we get out of this? The whole floor floated up, taking everything with it, the Christmas tree falling over, presents destroyed. And these floorboards here were actually rising up underneath me, and it felt like there was a creature underneath pushing me up, and the whole place was like a volcanic bubble. And then there was nothing you could do to stop it. You, you were just part of a nightmare. Jeff, Kat, and their neighbors escaped through the upper windows. The river owned the house at that point. We didn't have a house, we didn't have belongings. The river had got it. Jeff and Kat had to sort out the flotsam and jetsam of their flooded lives. You can see this, this kitchen, and you can see the mark there. It's, it's all completely, completely ruined. The floor's been pulled up. Uh, the contents of the fridge freezer, which was full of potential Christmas dinner, but um, ruined, everything ruined. The thing is about floods, it's the aftermath. You think of the event at the time, which was horrendous enough, but it's the aftermath of going to go through all your belongings, picking them out, and it's like going through your entire life and throwing it in a skip. Weird, the whole of your life disappears in a bag, doesn't it? Just seeing it all pushed into that van and the door closes and suddenly realising you don't own anything. <laughs> you literally got what you stand up in. I don't think people realise how attached they get to strange things like a picture or a chair or a cushion, silly things. It's only when they're taken from you, a bit like family and friends, you know, that you realise, oh, actually, that, that really meant something. Despite such individual tragedies, many will long remember Christmas 2013 for another reason. At the height of the Yuletide festivities, the power went out. Good evening and a very Merry Christmas to you. I'm afraid it's been a miserable day for tens of thousands of families around the country who face another night without power. Winds gusting to 90 miles per hour damaged power lines around the country. Over 50,000 homes without electricity. Christmas went back to the Dark Ages. It ruined the holiday for many, but others, like Ian Spall in Raynham, Kent, were determined not to be beaten. I realised I wouldn't be able to use the uh, oven, which is electric, um, and uh, I soon just came to the senses that I could use a barbecue, as I have done many times before. Just to show you, it does work. You can cook a turkey on a barbecue, especially on a rotisserie. 14-pound turkey. It's only been on about an hour, looking lively already. 
And down here you'll see on my other little barbecue I've got some more charcoal being prepared. That'll be ready in about 20 minutes or so. And just to help out breakfast, we've got the gas grill, get it warmed up for some toast. Lovely. It was kind of stressful and a lot of pressure was put on me because I was cooking for the whole family, but um, my skills in the barbecue, I was quite confident I could carry it off and uh, feed the whole family and more if needed. Around the country, people were determined to enjoy their Christmas. Power or no power. As the 12 days of Christmas continued, the storms and the sea had still not finished with Britain. <laughs> For many of us, the 12 days of Christmas brought nothing but weather misery. Storms, flooding, power cuts, and travel chaos. But the UK was not alone. You can see what it looks like here in Chicago. America's Northeast suffered a record-breaking cold snap as the polar vortex caused blizzards and dropped temperatures as low as minus 37 degrees. If you do not need to travel today, please stay home. As Niagara Falls froze over, some Americans found a new sport. Check this out. This is hot water, about to turn to snow. <laughs> Look at that. It only works at minus 25 and below. Don't try this in our UK climate. The big freeze in America may have been fun for some, but it had a serious effect on our weather too. It was yet another element that scientists believe compounded our Christmas storms. The cold weather in the eastern seaboard of America had an impact. It doesn't mean we're going to suddenly get an outbreak of rain, sleet and snow and hail. What it means, however, is that the contrast between the cold land and the warmer ocean is much greater. With that being greater, then the jet streams are stronger. We get deeper lows and more wet and windy weather. To make it all worse, the spring tides were once again at their peak early in the new year. A month after storm surges devastated the east coast. This time though, the tides would be the highest since the 1990s. On January the 3rd, winds of up to 80 miles per hour slammed giant walls of water against our shores. Around the coast, weakened sea cliffs gave way. Here we go! This is the 300-foot high cliff at Rockanore near Hastings in East Sussex. Oh, my God! Jesus! In Aberystwyth, the same deadly combination of high winds and high tides threw the biggest waves in living memory against the seafront. Tom Rule is at university here. In true student fashion, the first he knew about the storm was when he woke up. I slept completely through it. Last night, none of this was here. The time now is about 9.30. The next high tide was at 9.40 that morning. It brought in more massive waves. When I was filming it, I didn't really think about the danger. What I could think about was, oh my god, this looks so cool, and there's so much destruction. But thinking back now, yeah, probably it was quite a, a dangerous silly thing for me to go out my front door, especially with waves of that strength. Wow. <laughs> it's scary out here, yeah. That evening, police closed the seafront and evacuated all residents. 
Tom and the other students sheltered in the university buildings, where at least there was some good news. Twenty miles up the coast is the picturesque town of Barmouth. In the summer, this is a popular tourist destination, but now it was fighting for its life. These striking images were captured by Barmouth resident Dave Harding on his phone. The waves were enormous, like nothing I've ever seen before. It was crazy, it was, it was weird to watch, it was surreal. I've lived here all my life, 24 years, and I've never seen anything like that. The power of it was, was immense. Where the waves are actually breaking is the road, so it's breached the promenade wall. The owner of this cafe's car and his caravan around the back were actually floating over the next door fence. Everyone believed that the entire coastal strip had been evacuated. But in fact, one man was still trapped inside a cafe, dangerously close to the sea wall. It was Genghis Olmes, the cafe owner. He'd come to Barmouth four years earlier to start a new life. Now that life was in peril. We thought that the man had evacuated early in the morning, but then we started seeing the rescue coming from down the prom, so we obviously realised he was still there. Waves were covering the rescue people. You never know what's in the sea. It obviously brings stones, debris, wood, everything with it, so we were quite worried about the man who lived here and the crew that were rescuing him. It was panic and I scared because still water was racing. I saw sea joined in my building, absolutely like a lake in my garden and backside the garden as well. It's the nightmare. Genghis was rescued by the fire crew, but his cafe and his possessions were ruined. I am scared to sleep in my house now. <laughs> I am very sad at the moment. I don't know why I've started to settle up my life again. I don't know how I do. This is just all my saving, this building. Last four years, I'm managing business. I'm settled up to my new life here, but now it's all big damage. I don't know what I do. Next time, I'm speaking. Okay. By the middle of January, many people began the big cleanup from the storms that stole Christmas. The insurance industry estimated that the weather up to this point had caused half a billion pounds worth of damage. No one realized that far greater costs were still to come. For many, the idea of cleaning up has been a sick joke. Months after first flooding, the Somerset levels are still underwater. You can just see little clusters of houses, a few villages, some churches sticking out. But other than that, it's just a mass of water. And of course, no one knows when it's going to end. John Hebditch is a local farmer. I've been farming here about 40 years, and this year has proven to be one of the worst years I can ever remember. I'm standing here on the banks of the River Town, um, and out here is now one big lake where the river has broken over its banks. And as far as the eye can see is water. Somewhere out in the middle of that is our fields. Somehow I've got to earn a living out of that. One village, much only, became infamous as the floodwaters surrounded it on all sides. Supplies and journalists could get in only by boat, and some villagers found their homes were ruined. Well, we're cut off completely. Um, it's really hard work. There are properties in the village that are flooded. It's absolutely devastating. If you got it in your house, it's just pure hell on earth. One would like to think it's freak weather conditions, of course, and we could go another 10 years without it happening again. Yeah, we'd have been flooded. Nobody could have got all this water away short of digging something the size of the Suez Canal. Well, that's not practical. But it would not have been as bad with a decent level of river maintenance. Many people in the area blame a lack of dredging of the rivers for the extensive flooding. 
but it may not be that simple. We actually don't know whether dredging would be beneficial or not. In fact, actually, there's no good scientific evidence either way. And no amount of dredging could have stopped the record high water levels on major rivers like the Severn and the Thames. Some places, the river levels have been higher than they've been for 60 years. And overall, the river has pushed more water downstream than ever before since records began in 1883. Oil. To top it all, water even started bubbling up from under the ground. It's like a massive pimple. It is like a big pimple. And this is exactly what's happening with groundwater flooding. And just weeks ago, the sea came roaring in once again. A wet, sloppy Valentine's kiss for UK coasts. In the next programme, the floods that foiled New Year. The people of the UK caught every wave and chaotic weather event on their own cameras and phones. A caught-on-camera record of our wettest winter ever. So we forecast...